Well, Aaron, it is so great to have you back on the Flower Podcast. Welcome. Thank you for having me. This is thank you for being so flexible with my not so schedule that we could spend a time to do this. Well, it's my pleasure. And I, um, like I just said a few minutes ago to you, um, off the mic, I have been looking forward to this week and this time period for so long because following the journey of what you've been doing um, is, is, I don't know, I, I've got lots of thoughts on this, but we'll get into that later. Um, tell us a little bit about, um, just briefly for those, I can't imagine, but anybody who might not know kind of what you've been doing and what Florette's about. Um, I think since our last chat, a lot, a lot of things have changed. And so what does Florette look like now? Yeah, I mean, it's been a winding road a bit. So we started out um, as flower farmers. That's how I came to flowers and did that for well over a decade um, on a small two acre parcel of land and really developed like this process for getting so many flowers out of a little tiny piece of ground. Started teaching workshops, eventually started writing books. So I've written three books, one about dahlias, one about just growing flowers, and then another about flower arranging. And then we started a seed company because at the time, about nine years ago, you couldn't get the varieties of flowers that professional cut flowers could, growers could get as a home gardener. You only could buy them, you know, wholesale in bulk. And so I really wanted more people to have access to the really good stuff. And so we've had the seed company running alongside of everything else this whole time. But along the way, as I was finding varieties, trialing and testing to add to our seed collection, I could not find the colors or the textures that designers needed for weddings that um, would mix with other garden grown ingredients. Like I was just running into so many walls. I mean, I found a lot of beautiful things, but I started asking questions like, why don't these exist yet? And what about these colors and the companies would come out and the reps would come out and we'd, you know, talk about it and look at things and it just never went anywhere. So I kind of, it had not, it, well, I was frustrated. Like I wanted to figure out a solution. So I eventually, after many years of trial and error, figured out how to breed new flower varieties. And so we've been working on that in addition, and we are just coming up to our first big offering of what we call the Flora Originals, which are farm bred or refined varieties that have come from here that are going to now go out into the world. So yeah, it's all uh, flowers with the thread that have run through, um, but it has definitely become a winding journey. Sure. You know, I, I have to say <laughs> only because during the pandemic, um, and I, and I won't share, I won't share the name of the company, but um, I noticed there was a company that was hiring for somebody to work in their, uh, as a, in their sales area. And this company does a lot of seed. And it's, I think flowers are probably maybe 25% of their sales. And so I saw this huge opportunity and I was really kind of disappointed. I mean, I'm glad that door closed, but I'm, I, at the same time, I, I was really disappointed because I feel like they just never really saw the vision. When when these companies or these people came to your property and you're having these conversations, I mean, what was that like? I mean, because you have such a passion for this. I mean, was there a disconnect or how was that? Well, what I learned was that the people doing the breeding work, like the actual guys and the guys and gals, mostly guys in the field, do not have any connection to the end user, the, the florist, the farmer, the home gardener, and all throughout the middle are all of these big, you know, corporations and right. brokers and this, you know, global supply chain. And so there's just this huge disconnect between what people want and need and, you know, just makes them cry and what's being created. And that was always the, the bridge I was trying to build and I'm way more excited than anybody else about this, I think. So I probably scared them. You know, they come out and I don't know what they thought, but 
Um, usually they would come out because I had written an article or they were, they were getting lots and lots of emails and requests from people from something I had shared. And they were kind of like, what, what is this? They, they're usually kind of annoyed, like not super, not as excited as I was. So, sure. but I was always asking like, why aren't you listening to the end user of your products, your varieties? And like, well, we don't have any connection with them. We're we're a wholesale producer, so we sell to the seed companies. Then the seed companies sell. You know, there's just a lot of people along the way um, that I think it's almost like the game of telephone. By the time you get to the end of it, what is being created and what people want, they just they don't always go hand in hand. Yeah. Now that's that's really well said. The thing I appreciate about your position in the market and the thing I appreciate about your your passion with this is you have the perfect eye for finding these colors and recognizing their value. I feel like a lot of times these seed companies, you know, they're always gearing towards the home gardener. You know, it's like, as you said, the telephone game, there's all these filters that go through and like this person's opinion and that person's opinion and each, they, they all have their agenda or their market they're trying to reach. But to me, this, this is where they are so short-sighted because it's, it's a win-win for everybody across the board. And, I think yeah. that they're they're so focused. I mean, bedding plants are really where the big sales are in terms of flowers. And so I think they're just putting the bulk of their energy into that. And they're like, well, if it works for bedding, those colors would translate over to cut flowers. And we're like, no, they don't. We don't want any more red. Please no more scarlet, you know, like no more gold. We can't. Like, what are we going to do with this? <laughs> <laughs> um, indeed, indeed, yeah. I feel that. Well, and the thing too that I love about this is that your color selection really helps elevate a whole genus, like zinnias, for example. I, I mean, so many times, because you know, me, I work with local flower farmers and buy for our local wholesale house that sells to florists. And you know, even though we sell a lot of them, a lot of times people stay away from them because they feel very pedestrian. They feel you know, like they're not the right colors, but it was funny. We have a local grower who I think grew one of your varieties. It was one of the softer yellow ones. And I can't remember the name mm -hmm. of it off the top of my head. Golden Hour. Yes, Golden Hour. And that came in and I was a little nervous because I think we got like 30 bunches the first time. And we're like, okay, I don't, this is either going to be huge success or not. And they flew out the door because they're the right awesome. shade. And that's the thing yeah. is like, nobody wants canary yellow. Not everybody right. wants big bird yellow, but that softer hue that, that helps blend colors and blend with colors is so incredible. So um, I, I just want to learn more about this whole process. I know there's all kind of stuff going to come out with the launch about what you, you know, your story and how you did it. But you know, for our listeners, how um, this is, this has been going on for how long? From when I first discovered the very first plant, it has been seven years, which is wild. That was like the very, my very first variety was golden hour. And I had no idea what I was doing. And in a way, I still don't feel like I know what I'm doing. I'm starting to get the hang of it. Things come back true. They come back more true the next year. You know, I mean, obviously we're definitely getting the hang of it, but there's so much to learn. And I came to this as a flower grower, a farmer, <clears throat> like a passionate gardener, not from a science background. So how it all works, you got me. I just know what I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's not, I mean, I know I was reading, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of information on this. There's none there from what I can find. And I have spent all of these years trying to find it. It doesn't exist. It's, it's either within the big, huge companies that do the breeding work or you might have a handful of growers around the world, like maybe five or six zinnia breeders in total around the world. But usually it seems like flower breeders are very unusual, solitary creatures that want to be out with the plants, do their thing. They don't, I mean, they may write it down, but they definitely don't interact with a lot of other people. And so you're not going to find that information. It's just, it's not publicly available. Do you think that's because these big corporations 
try to make things proprietary. Like they just don't want to, you know, give oh, up. for their, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, they put, I mean, the amount of time and energy and resource that goes into developing a new variety is unbelievable. And so it makes sense that you would protect the, all of the, that knowledge, you know, if you're wanting right. to, you want to keep it secret so you can, um, keep it your own. I mean, you're protecting your investment, but at the beginning of this project, I kept saying to the flowers, the universe, whatever, if you help me figure this out, I swear I will share what I learn. Like I, I wanted to learn, but I also, I want this information to be available. I want other people to know how to do it. Seed saving is so important. Mm. Being able to breed new varieties is hugely important, especially with the way the, you know, weather's heating up, the planet's changing. <clears throat> it's important work. And so part of this project has been developing the new varieties, but then documenting how we're doing it um, along the way. Yeah, because now all of a sudden we, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're empowering, you know, thousands of people to, you know, whether it's, you know, pansies or, sunflowers or totally. whatever it is it, all of a sudden now any um anybody with a passion uh and an eye might have the opportunity to to change the world and especially That's with cut flowers yeah yes yeah and if we can design a system where readers are comp recognized and compensated for their work by the public that they're making these varieties for you could cut out all of the, you know, the middlemen along the way and have the gardeners and the farmers saying, this is what we want and need. And then independent plant breeders could go, I could figure out how to do that. And then marrying those two together, you don't need everybody in between. But I mean, the reason most of the breeding is done by the big companies is because those are the only jobs that pay. Right. Now so the sense. talented breeders work for the big guys. Right. Well, it's funny. It's not funny, really, but it's it's kind of I think about a conversation I had um, with Christine Santa Cruz Dahlia's and um, and she was talking about the fact that there have been like chocolate dahlias, true topi chocolate dahlias of the past that have that have appeared. But because the the societies, the the show people that show these flowers don't didn't think thought it was a bad color you know it, it goes to the garbage heap it goes to the compost pile and it's like you know we all would be like just freaking out over something like that right now well that's like the cafe au lait dahlia <clears throat> all of the like hardcore dahlia breeders that are, like do a lot of shows think it's the worst dahlia of all they don't get it so that's what's amazing is that most of the breeding work is done by people that are breeding within the dahlia world for shows, sure. not for cut flowers. So there's, again, a disconnect. And I think if the information and the starting material could be more available for passionate people, I just wait. This is going to be a tidal wave of flower breeding. That's my well, hope. So out of, I mean, because you're releasing how many <clears throat> varieties next week? 26 and out 26 of Fridays, but on the farm, we have nearly 500 in the works between <laughs> Dahlia and Zinnias. I know it's, so this is like a big deal, but it's also just the beginning of this project. So there's like a tsunami coming is what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, this kind of feels like a tsunami, this, this release, but yeah, it's, um, oh my gosh, the colors, like this was what we figured out to begin with since this we figured out since the seed that we have available it's awesome but we've since improved it so the the stuff that's coming behind it is more double has more color gradients um oh my gosh we got into brighter colors with purple casts and iridescent glitter and i don't even know what's happening here it's like the fairies are just i don't even know but there's <laughs> I'm really excited about these varieties, but you should see the stuff that's behind them. Oh, okay. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for that teaser. That that's really great. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, that, cause while I was going with that, I'm thinking how many things get 
called out and like what what percentage do you feel like uh, is your success rate? I mean, do you end up throwing away 80%, 90%? I mean, with that much breeding, you know there's a lot that are not going to happen. Oh, totally. Um, like in a given, if I was working on selecting one variety and I saved some seed off of maybe a plant in an open field, grow that seed out the next year, I might get a few plants out of a thousand that come back true to the original one I was going for. So take everything out that's not those, maybe keep the three or four plants, a very small percentage, keep those isolated together you know, have the flies or bees pollinate those, save that seed. The next year I might get 10 to 20%, save that. And each year, the percentage of them coming back true to what you want increases if you're very, very strict about roguing and selection. That's why it takes so long. Mm, um, sure. If you, if you skip that process and release a variety too soon, the percentage of the mix will not be very high, you know, the high. So that's what I see a lot of people doing. They're like, I collected off of this flower in my open pollinated field, like probably 2% of the seeds will actually produce a flower that look like what you're going for. It just, it takes years of refinement and selection. Um, and then of course I've been discarding all the bright colors, <laughs> any gold or scarlet goes, <laughs> But I'm I'm starting now that I'm like, I don't know if I can handle any more blush. Like I'm kind of, I love it, but you should see how many blush selections we've got. Probably 13 different ways with tufted and tiny little ones and big fat ones and cactus ones. I mean, so now I'm starting to venture a little bit into brighter colors. Mm. Well, yeah, I, <laughs> I see a little bit of that in some of the the offerings of the 27 that I was kind of, which I was excited about. Okay. So I have to admit one of the freakiest things that has, that I've been following you that that happened was the introduction of flies to pollinate. I'm like, where did yeah. that, I'm like, I have never heard that. And they're like, but Aaron's using flies now. She's harnessing, you know, the maggot, the mighty maggot to do her pollination. Um, I've got to know more about that. I mean, I just, isn't that I disgusting? It's like <laughs> you would never, it's sort of like, you know, it takes so much ugliness and gross manure and everything to make a be grow a beautiful plant. Well, it takes a lot of maggots and larva to <laughs> produce a beautiful seed crop. So we started, um, we went to a big vegetable growers conference and we were trying to figure out how do you produce seed inside of what they call an isolation cage, because I wanted to work on more varieties than just one, but you can't grow <clears throat> more varieties than one in a field or they'll all cross. So we built all of these special hoop houses with bug netting over them. And we used bumblebees inside of a lot of them, but they are a little bit aggressive. Sometimes you get a mean hive and they'll get you. It's scary. We're all like freaking out. Like if you get a mean hive and it does happen, um, but in a smaller enclosure, you can't use a bumblebee hive. There's just too many bees per square foot. So we started sure. experimenting with flies. So now during the growing season, we get, uh, we call it Friday's fly day and we get a giant or two box of pupa that are unhatched and we scoop them out with a measuring cup into these little hot dog boats and we stick them inside of the different enclosures and they hatch, crawl around on the flowers and pollinate. It's disgusting. They smell, they're grown on fish waste. So you just like add another level of nasty. But I wanted people to see what it actually takes. And it's funny and it's weird. And you're like, that cannot even be possible. But yeah, there's just so many weird things we've learned along the way. I mean, I just didn't think of flies as gravitating towards flowers, you know, like bees do. And yeah, and and then just hopping on and going from one flower to the next. I mean, it's just, um, it's crazy. They're kind of dumb. They just sort of, when they first hatch, they don't have wings. And so they just sort of run around in a circle. Then eventually they can fly and they just land on anything and walk around. They're just, I don't know even know what they're doing. They don't, I don't think they're intentionally pollinating. They're just like hanging out. But you walk into one of the hoop houses that has flies in it and it's like a cloud of them. They're all over you. It smells like fish. 
It is not romantic. <laughs> and that's what it took to produce these seeds. So they are grown with love and a lot of larva. <laughs> Uh, there's a t-shirt love and larva there you go like, yeah yep. um I, I i mean you don't need to where tell do you us go from there right? i know you don't need to tell us but i'm thinking where do you even does Am oh, yeah. amazon <laughs> to get your, to get there your... is there's a place in idaho what is it called um tree. bork tree ranch F-O-R-K-E-D, Fork Tree Ranch. And that's where we order larva from. And they they use it for, um, I think, bait, but also it works for pollination. And so we have a standing order every week. And it's crazy how much money you can spend on flies <laughs> when you're breeding. <laughs> wow. But they're great. They're, they, yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine what the operation is like. There's somewhere else in California, I don't know the name of it, but there are sources for this stuff. Amazing. It's a whole business. It's a yeah. whole thing. It's a whole thing. Yeah. Well, okay, imagine so, that that was your business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we could all, yeah, we could always say it could get worse. It might get worse, but I don't know. For There's, sure. There could be a lot of money in maggots. I don't, I don't know. Um, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're going to change gears here. I, um, out of all of the 27 new varieties you're offering, um, I'd like maybe, I know like with dahlias, I think you have dahlias, celosia, and zinnias. Is that mm -hmm. the three groups? So I know when I've looked at the dahlias, to me, I mean, they're amazing colors and everything. What are, maybe what, can you tell us like what the differences in some of them are? Because sometimes I'm not exactly sure to the untrained eye what, you know, really, I mean, zinnias are easy and celosia are easy, but with the dahlias, I was kind of curious. Yeah. So there are four mixes of dahlias that we are offering. And over the years, we've done a lot of experimenting with collecting seed off of certain plants or a certain form like anemones or mm. say collarettes, and then testing that by growing them out and seeing what percentage of the offspring have those characteristics. So there's a variety of dahlia called florette that I bred years ago, and she's so beautiful. It's never been out on the market before, but it's it's really, really special. And she makes so much great seed. And almost every one of her seedlings ends up being beautiful, which is rare with dahlia seedlings. A lot of times you get a lot of dogs. Right. You, you know, the percentage of really cool ones is kind of low. They're fun. The bees love them. But so the petite florets is a mix from florette. And they're these strange, muddy, muted colors with like kind of a lavender haze. They're really special. Most of them are in anemone form or collarettes. Um, the shooting stars mix came from a huge field of only collarette varieties that we collected seed from. So the, the seedlings from them are in, they have stripes and speckles and airbrushes and twizzles and pointed petals and ruffled petals. It's crazy. So, but they're almost, they're probably 99% single center but the petal forms and colors are all over the board. So that one's really fun. Um, Bee's Choice is a mix of pretty much all the, not leftovers, but some of the colorettes, some florette, some ball field, some formal decorative field. It's like a big melting pot of every kind of variety, every variety or field growing on the farm. And then there's the Can Can Girls, which is from the anemone field. And about 70% of those, of the babies that come back, have that fluffy center, the little, love. you know, dangly petals. I love them. So that one's really fun. But man, they do not produce seed. That was so much work. So we won't offer those guys again. Um, so get them while you can. <laughs> but they're really cool. <laughs> but they were so much work. Eric's like, Eric, who's our, our seed specialist, he, you know, he's cleaned all of this seed and he, he does an amazing job. He's like, no, no more of those. Like we, that was too hard. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, yeah. So they are four, they're four distinct mixes that you could grow all four and you definitely get different things in each one of them. Right. And with the zinnias, um, I know a lot of the amazing colors that we've been seeing. Um, and I think of precious metals, for example. Um, now are, is, their variation in some of these varieties you're releasing, or do you feel like they're going to be pretty much true? Um, I guess what I'm trying to zinnias? ask is, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So where 
they are not a hundred percent true. Like say you grew a hybrid zinnia, like the Zowies or the uproar series, right. every single one of those is going to be completely uniform with these mixes or varieties. I would say you're, you should definitely get at least 90% of them to come back true to what they're supposed to be probably more, but just to be on the safe side. And then you will get the occasional bright yellow one or a hot pink one. And we still haven't totally figured out how to get that to stop happening. So this is like our best effort. Yeah. They're quite true to form, but there you will get some weirdos and you'll get some fun surprises. But for the most part, they will very much be true to the picture. Um, and then some are more mixes like precious metals has about five colors in the mix where right. Alpine glow is a much tighter range of color. There's a little variation, but it's a much more refined color. Mm. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. wondering, because I know like with some of like with precious metals, there was I mean, there were so many beautiful shades that you have been working on. And mm -hmm. I was curious if that was kind of that mix. Um, and Celosia, and I can't remember, I know I looked, but I can't remember, is it one or two? How many varieties of Celosia are you releasing? It's 10 or 12. I should know the exact number, but it's oh, quite a few okay. Celosias. Yeah. So some are more of a mix that have like distinct, you know, burgundy, scarlet, rhubarb, you know, copper, like a rainbow. And then others that are very, very uniform. It's just the, we were able to select one color from the mix get that to come back true. So the Celosia, you'll see a lot less. I, they're going to be more like 98%, 97% true. You'll get a few off types. Um, zinnias are a little harder to rein in. They just have a mind of their own. So okay. yeah, there's a whole range of Celosias, a whole range of zinnias, and then we've got the dahlias. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think too with zinnias, I think a lot of times um, you're breeding for more than just color, you know, for shape, for the center, yeah. for petal count. I mean, there's, there's a lot of factors going into that, that I think makes it more complicated just in itself. Um, I'm trying to think of questions that I know that people that are probably popular questions. Like for example, um, after this particular sale, I, I, we would love, I mean, I know you would love to sell out. Do you feel like this is going to be, a, uh, a one week, one day, one month wonder, or you have no way of knowing, I know, but just the interest that you've already, maybe people have already expressed to you. I'm curious what you think will happen. Well, the reason we waited so long to do this, we, because I really wanted to be able to make these varieties available last year and a little bit the year before, but we had, we waited because I wanted to make sure we had enough seed to actually do this right because the worst thing is to get everybody excited and then not have nearly enough and then it's just a bad experience for them a bad experience for our team so we have a lot of seed everybody says we're going to break the internet and we're going to sell out i have a hard time imagining that it's it's a lot of seed so we really and then we also produced two solid years worth of seed, but after seeing the interest that there is and wanting to make sure that everybody who wants it can get it, we are gonna make all of that seed available in this sale. So I, I feel like for the most part, with most of the varieties, there are a few that are limited, but for the most part, we should have, I feel like we have plenty, but I don't, it's, it is really yeah, hard to gauge. We've never done anything like this, um, but based on past years, sales and lots of projections. And I, I think we're going to have, we have a lot of seed is okay. I guess what I'm saying. A lot. Okay, good. Yeah. No, that's but, great. but it is like, get it this year because if everybody wanted all the golden hour this year, we would let it go out into the world. I just, I want the seed to go. It feels like it's, it's time. And so come and get it. Sure. And yeah. That being said, I'm curious, is there a limit to how many package, like how many, like if, if a grower wants to grow a lot, is there a limit to how many they can get? Or is that, I'm just curious. Then how this they, is, that, yeah. Yeah. That's been the hard part is limiting because we, we typically sell to home gardeners or budding flower farmers with our seed, smaller quantities not to many of the flower farmers because they buy in larger volumes. So I wanted to be able to have the limit be high enough that a flower farmer who really wants to put these into production on their field can grow a whole patch of them. So the limit on packets is at 25, which I think feels too high to some people, but I also 
want this, these are really they're absolutely bred for the garden market but really they're for flower farmers i mean this is like this is what we've needed for all of these years so yes. i want people to be able to grow them in abundance if they want to sure and, and then one other yeah. oh when it comes to the zinnias four of the varieties that are part of this first offering were were I wouldn't say created because Corey and I don't feel like we created these, but we're refined in collaboration with Corey from Dawn Creek Farm. Mm. So there we have four of her beautiful mixes that we've been working on for the last, I'd say about four years here on the farm. So it's her babies and our babies all going together. That's exciting. I well, know. Uh, so let me ask this question because, you know, sometimes since you have demonstrated interest in like saving seed and that whole process. If I'm a local farmer and is it okay for me to save seed from these or how does that work? Or is there patents yep. or, how, you know, that's a big thing. So. Well, these, so these varieties are all open pollinated, meaning if you save the seed from them, they will come back true, which is amazing. They're not hybrids in that way. So this seed, you only ever have to buy it once, and then you could keep saving it over and over and over again. You will need to make sure that it's isolated from other varieties. So if you grew Golden Hour and Alpen Glow together in the field and didn't separate them from each other, it's going to be a mix if you saved the seed. So there are things that you need to do, but you could save seed from any of these varieties and it will come back true. Um we're totally encouraging flower farmers and home gardeners to save the seed for their own use to trade, but we are asking that folks do not sell it mm. uh, without asking for permission, setting up in an agreement, just because I want to make sure that these varieties stay pure and true and really high quality. And that also we put so much time and energy into developing these varieties and it would be very easy for growers to just put them into production start selling the seed like a lot of people have done with um don creek seed but in order for a breeder to actually make a living doing this a percentage of those earnings need to come back to the breeder and so that's a lot of what we're figuring out right now um this is a whole new world for all of us so it's right. exciting but there's also a lot of questions yeah, no, that's completely yeah. fair. And I, and, I, and I think that's reasonable because, you know, if you're doing it for your own cup production, that's one thing. But now, yeah, it's, I mean, seven years is a lot of financial investment. Yeah. Um, a lot of resources. And especially, I know I've kind of felt like a lot of people were concerned that you were not going to be carrying any of the other seeds you've been known for for this right. you know, many years. Um, how does that feel? Is that a little scary giving that up or are you glad to maybe not be dealing with that anymore? Well, it's, it's more that it's a little sad. I mean, it mm. has been, it felt like this big mission. Like we wanted to get these amazing varieties into the hands of all these people. I wanted to bring awareness and it just, it's been a really fun experience, but it's gotten very big. And in order for us to keep supplying all the people that want those seeds, that's kind of all that we can do. We can either do that or we can do the breeding, but I can't do both, especially with 500 varieties of breeding. I mean, you know, I, I get going, so it's out of control and it's only going to get worse. So I really had to choose. Do I want to stay with what we've been doing or be brave and step out and pursue this deep passion of mine but to me, it seems like a really wonderful opportunity for so many smaller seed companies. There's like, there's a ton of demand. All these customers are already here. People are excited about it. Like they're just making way for a whole new group of seed companies to pop up. So, but I know it's thrown people for a loop. I'm like, I know I've been talking about this for the last couple of years, but it, yeah, it, we had to make the choice. And so this is the year that we're making that big transition. Well, I know that's probably scary in a lot of ways, but I can appreciate your sentiments about it being sad too. I, I, I don't know. I feel like um, this is, like I've said before, this is just going to be the, the beginning of some great things. Okay. So um, I know that often when people buy a seed in bulk and all those other things, there's different. And I know with the limit that you just mentioned, seems like a fair start for everybody to kind of get a piece of it. But 
Uh, I know you must be getting questions about wholesale. And then I also know on the website, you can kind of get a taste of what the prices are going to be like. Um, and honestly, I know, I'm just going to say it before you explain anything that when I saw the prices, I felt like, wow, they seem a little, they not, not bad. Wow. But they seem higher than what most people are used to. But yeah. When you think of seven years of investment, I thought they were a bargain. So, I mean, that's kind of my, my perspective on it. Um, and that you, that you can't get this kind of stuff from all your traditional companies. So what are your thoughts on, on all of that? I would say of all of the pieces that are part of this big offering, the pricing was mostly the most challenging. I mean, it's, it's such a loaded topic. It's so hard yeah. to price things and figure it out. We want everybody to be able to get some of these seeds, but also we have been investing in this for so many years. I mean, it's, so we tried to find a strike a balance between the investment because it's all self-funded. It's not like we're working with a giant corporation that, right. you know, we're not sending these down to South America to be produced, you know, very inexpensively, like it's done here on our farm. So the price is about three times what a normal packet of say zinnia seeds would cost, um, which is quite a bit more. But my hope is that say someone wanted to buy three packets. Well, instead they could get one, but then I'm gonna show them how to save their seeds so they'll never have to buy them again. So this summer we, last summer we filmed a seed saving mini course um, demonstrating celosia, zinnias and dahlias. And so anybody that is, going to be getting seeds as part of this first offering, we're going to teach them how to save their own. So hopefully that will help offset the higher price. But I know it is a bit of like sticker shock. I totally get it. And, but that's just what it's got to be. Yeah. Well, I think too, that if, if anyone's been following along and see them, they know the values there. And especially like you said, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a perennial at that point, you know, you, it, a peony costs a lot of money to put in the ground, but the cut stems that you get in three years and on more than pay for that, it just, you know, requires that investment. So, yeah. Um, and it's like, when you think of a dahlia, a brand new dahlia introduction, most of those tubers, I mean, they run 30 plus dollars and that's not uncommon. So with the addition of being able to save the seed off of these, my hope is that yes, it's an investment up front, but then you're able to recoup that if you're selling flowers, but just by saving your own seed, you really truly don't have to ever get them again. You know, right. never have to buy them again. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, let me ask this question and maybe you can help with the three groups that you're releasing. Like how far apart do you need to plant things in order to kind of, or separate them in order to kind of have them come true? They typically say about a quarter of a mile. So wow. it's a lot more than you'd think. Like dahlias can be a bit closer. No one's proven that. We've been doing tests where we were planting them farther and farther apart to see, you know, where the, the crossing happens. But yeah, about a quarter of a mile. So if you want to isolate a particular variety of celosia or zinnias, and you don't have that amount of distance between two varieties, or if your neighbor's growing them in their backyard, oh, yeah. they're going to cross. So you have to build a greenhouse or some kind of structure to keep the pollinators out. And then it, by locking them in, you have to introduce pollinators like flies or bees. So it's a significant investment to be able to grow multiple varieties of the same, you know, zinnia on your farm. You have to invest in these structures. So that's kind of a big, that's a lot of where the, the investment has been. So yeah, you got a quarter mile to be safe. Wow. Wow. It's kind and, of disappointing, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit. But I mean, at the <laughs> yeah. same time, though, I mean, can you self-pollinate and then bag them or something like that? So you don't have the internet or is that I mean, on a small oh, you, scale, you could do that maybe. But yeah. Yeah, you totally can on a small scale with a paintbrush and a little organza bag. And we've done that with some cro intentional crosses that we've made. But I would say if you're going to produce seed in larger amounts, well, if you're very organized, I'm not in that kind of a way. I'd have no patience for the paintbrush, but you could totally do it and it does work. Well, and yeah. I mean, you know, and if you're doing it for three or four varieties, maybe that's not a big deal. But if you're doing it for 500, that might be a little different situation. Exactly. So, so we have yeah. just a lot of small greenhouses and, or small hoop houses, and then we call them flycellations, which are 
you know, these little tiny structures that have say five or six plants. And then we just introduce flies every week and they help us. It's yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome and disgusting. Yeah. Well, um, I wanted to just briefly touch on, uh, your very first Florette original film, uh, your interview with Allah and sharing her story, which I will go ahead and announce that we were excited. We had an interview with her thanks to you. And, uh, we'll be releasing that in a, in a few weeks, but I, um, what an amazing gift. Number one, just what she does. Um, how did you come across, how did you find her? How did, how did this all come about? Because, um, I, I'm just excited for that opportunity to learn about her and what she does. It's so cool. So I found her through Grace Alexander's blog. Um, she had done a piece on her and I saw the pictures. I'm like, wait, I know clematis and I don't know these varieties. Like what is going on here? So then of course I did, you know, fell down the rabbit hole, went to her site, ordered one of everything she had, well, three of everything she had in stock, and then immediately reached out to her. I'm like, how do I not know you? Like, I feel like I know everybody. How do I not know about you? And so we started going back and forth and became friends over the summer. And just the more I got to know her, the more impressed I was by her just as, as a person, she's just mm -hmm. incredibly inspiring. And I felt like if more people knew about her story and what she's doing, they would also connect with her. So we decided to do this special project and make a film about her, but we had so many limitations. Like we can't fly to Ukraine right. and film. Um, should we don't like, it was it, so many things lined up to make that project possible, including Ola teaching herself how to film. We found an amazing local cinematographer that was studying at a film school who was willing to, you know, take the bus six hours to go and spend two days with her. And we were able to tell an incredible story. And a lot of all the interviews were done over Zoom. And, but you can't, you can't tell that in the film. Yeah. Her spirit and essence and her heart, it just shines through. And it was really, really special thing to get to be part of. And it's been amazing the support she's received. Like um, we offered her ebook in our shop to make it easier for people. And so many people have gotten her ebook and we sold her out of seeds and um, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Yeah. Um, uh, I know I was having lunch with a mutual friend of ours, Gabriella Salazar, mm -hmm. and we were, um, we were I was talking about her, Ala, and, and the clematis and, and I uh, was share. Anyway, I ended up showing her my copy of the digital book on my phone, and she's like, "I've got to get this." I mean, it was so funny. And yeah, and it's like, I mean, the images are amazing. Um, the way she writes is so great, and the information. Like, I had no idea there were so many varieties of um, clematis. Yeah, I just who it even is. knew? And then <laughs> so many of the varieties that she specializes in growing are good for cuts, but those tiny little bells, like it's out of control. Yeah. We're starting seeds this next week. And I think I have about 80 varieties from her. <laughs> I got a lot of seed. <laughs> wow. There's a shocker. <laughs> right. I know. Jeez. <laughs> well, I think I only bought eight. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I'm getting ready to start mine too. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, what a, what a neat process. And I know when I, when I, uh, when I've bought flowers from Japan, I know there's some varieties of clematis that they offer as a cut, which I typically don't buy because they are so astronomically expensive. Right. Um, but when I saw her photographs, there are a lot of the same you know, species and things like that. And I'm just like, I totally saw that in a second. And I'm like, well, you know what? I guess it's time to try and see, see what we can well, do. What if, what if they become a good cut flower crop and farmers can add them into their mix? I mean, all of us, I think are just like, wait, what? This is yeah. incredible. And thanks to all we got to learn all about them. Yeah. Yeah. That was so yeah. great. Uh, you know, I've got to say that, especially recognizing that, and of course, I know you've been doing some amazing film work with Chris and you guys have team. I mean, you guys make such a great team for this, but 
I also know that you've been, I don't know if you've partnered, is it Blue Chalk? I don't know what the name, what's the media company or I don't know how that's all worked, but you can tell that the level of production for that was just so different, but it was, I mean, everything's always great, but I was like, what's going on with that? What's the plans for Florette Films? Right. So we have worked with it. We worked with a production company based in Portland called Blue Chalk Media on the first and second season of Growing Florette and formed such incredible relationships with the team on their side and with us. And then, of course, Chris learned cinematography and they were just so amazing to help. Um, they just kept folding him in on the crew. And then he'd, you know, first he was assisting and then he'd, you know, hold the camera steady. And then by the end, he was helping film. So now he knows how to film. And um, Rob, the director, and I had such a great relationship back and forth and had so much fun working together and just really felt like there's more here. There are more stories that we want to tell and that we don't want to always have to get permission to tell. Like, I feel like there's so many amazing things that I think people would fall in love with. And just having to jump through all the hoops with the networks and all of that, we just decided to kind of go out on our own and start making beautiful things. So, um, yeah, so it's Rob and then one of the editors from Growing Florette and one of the cinematographers. So we have all been working together on some special projects and we're figuring out what exactly we want to do with it, but it's very, very exciting. Yeah. yeah well, so I can't wait to see what's next. Well, I think what's next is you had mentioned, or I think before we started recording that you're releasing a new film on this whole seed journey. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to be putting out a short film about the breeding varieties and what went into them, the story behind them and the many hands that have helped to bring them, you know, to the world and just to share with people kind of everything that's gone into this. So I'm excited to be able to share it. It's really special. It's a lot of like old archival footage and old photographs and, um, but it's very cool. Like you get to see how these, how they were born and became, you know, how they came to be. So that's really exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing that. So what do you think, the fact that you mentioned that made me think, what has been the hardest part of being your own breeder and this whole process? Um, well, I'm not very patient. So I have, I like to get stuff done fast. I want to fast track it. I want to speed it up. And breeding is very slow. Like you only have one growing season at a time. You can only make so much progress and then you have to wait until the next year to see if it worked. So I would say that the speed at which this has moved um, has been painful for me. And then, well, gosh, just the scale of it all, like really the production of bringing not all of the development, all the years of development that it takes to refine a variety, but then to put it into production to produce enough seed, to try to anticipate the, the demand, produce enough. It's just, it's it's very complex and we've just, we've learned a lot, but it's been challenging. I could see why the big companies are so good at it because it's the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And especially when you are doing things all over the world with different, you know, different for different reasons and for, yeah. you know, different outcomes. But, um, well, I, I hope that you've continued to inspire a whole new generation of breeders and that's that's really thrilling what um you know i always like to end our episodes with a piece of advice and and after you just said that i'm you know who knows what you're going to say but i i always love to ask what would you like to leave with our listeners oh i think anything worth doing it just like anything that really matters to you, that's really special, that's really important, it takes time. That it, it, it just does to do something really well. So being patient, sticking with it, and not giving up before you 
kind of bring that dream into reality. It's so easy along the way you get, you know, knocked down and all these setbacks, it could be very easy to give up. So I would say like, if you can just stick with it, you knew when you first started out on this journey, whatever that is, you knew what you were going for. So just try to keep a hold of that and keep going. Yeah. I can't imagine the the challenges along the way. Um, Aaron, it's always a pleasure to talk and I really appreciate your time and I can't wait to see how this all unfolds in, in a week. I can't believe it's just a week away now. So, I know. I know. Uh, this was awesome. Thank you for having me and being so flexible. I know my schedule was such a nightmare and we found a time though. And I'm, I'm just, I'm so grateful. <laughs>